Church matters. It matters more than you might think. Let me begin by reminding you of a familiar story from Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and down and there confuse their language. So they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the whole face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel. Because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Familiar story. It's where we get the, the table of nations, the division of nations where we get the divisions of languages and different ethnicities and people groups. This is where it began. When God came down and saw the people gathered together saying, we're going to build a big tower and it's going to reach the heavens and everybody's going to know that we're down here. And God went down and said, I, I don't like this idea. This is not what I made you for. And at that moment, he struck them. Confuse their language. You can, you can imagine the picture. Hey, toss me another brick. He throws a hammer at it. You know, it's just, they confuse their language. And all of a sudden they had to realize, hey, who, who's speaking in a way that I can understand? And they, they separated themselves and spread out over the whole face of the earth. From that point, and we see even today, the different groups scattered around the globe. We're not studying Genesis this morning. We're actually going to be in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to turn there. We'll be looking at the words on the screen as well here in just a moment. But let me catch you up where we are. Ephesians is, take everything that Paul wrote and shrink it down to as tight a ball as you can put it, and that's the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a phenomenal book of who we are as Christians, saved by the grace of God and unified by the grace of God together. That's the theme. Grace and unity is the theme of the book of Ephesians. He opens the book by pretty much saying, let me just reveal to you all of the grace of God. And he begins listing over and over and over again all of these benefits and blessings that come from the grace of God in chapter 1. It's almost like presents under a Christmas tree and they just keep coming and coming and coming and coming. In, in, in the original language it's actually a run on sentence. We don't like run on sentences in English so we broke it up a little bit but it's, it's a massive list of all the blessings that come with being in Christ. Of receiving the grace of God. And then Paul turns and he gives a thanksgiving and prayer that, that the people would understand and see how blessed they are. And then we get to chapter 2 and we have that amazingly powerful, well-known passage that our, our salvation that we have in Jesus is not of works. It is by grace you have been saved. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We've been saved by grace, a free gift from God, not of works, so that no one may boast. But we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And that sets the tone as he now begins to unpack the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, our unity, that God has now taken those who are far away, meaning the Gentiles who had no knowledge of the God of Israel, no knowledge of the one true and living God, and he's taking the people of Israel who had, the, who had Moses, who had David and the prophets, and he's taking them and he's mashed them together in this thing that he's going to call the church here in just a minute. He's mashed together. This is the mystery of God's grace. And he says, because of grace, we now have all of these things together. 
God is doing something amazing. I want us to look at chapter 3. We're going to read verses 7 through 13 to get a little bit of the context, but we're going to be keying in on verses 10, 11, and 12 this morning as we look at the cosmic significance of the church. That's what we're looking at this morning. The cosmic significance of the church. If you have a Bible, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through 13 is what we're going to read together. Follow along with me as I read aloud. Of this gospel... Paul speaking, he says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden from the ages in God who created all things so that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose which he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart. The Lord, I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. There's a lot here, but I want to key in specifically in verses 10, 11, and 12, pointing to the fact that the church is brought together to glorify God. The church is brought together to glorify God. The first thing I want us to see in verse 10, the cosmic reality of the church. Look at verse 10 again. So that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Our society here in the Western world used to be centered on the church. In fact, most towns were founded by water, a river, a lake, something, somewhere they could get fresh water to drink, and a church, a steeple in the middle of the town. That was the meeting hall of local communities and towns throughout the Americas when it first began. It was the, the mission house or the church house is where the center of the town began to develop. That was the center point. That was town hall was the church. In fact, if you trace back to the American Revolution, Patrick Henry gave his now famous speech, give me liberty or give me death at St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. The Alamo was a mission. It was a church before it was known as a fortress today. But yet in our day, the church has been relegated far off to the side. Churches are not wanted to be in the center of community, of community life. In fact, churches are often kind of, you know, we'll tolerate you, go build out there on the, you know, don't, don't, come, don't come to the center of town. We don't want you in the center of society. We want you to just kind of be out there and do your own thing, but, but don't, don't interfere with what we're doing. No longer is the church a silent moral majority, rather a moral minority learning to function on the fringes of society rather than in the middle. Church is drastically different from what it was. But that does not change its significance. It does not change its cosmic importance. Now the church, even by its members though, is often relegated to a much lower level of importance. And here's the danger for us. We often send, tend to see church as, when it's convenient for me, I'll be there. When, it, when it's good for me, I'll be there. But you know, I'd much rather be on my boat thinking about God than in church thinking about my boat. <coughs> but we got to understand the church is of cosmic importance. It's far more important than you or I make it out to be. We just experienced culture-shaping weeks. Between Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, lives and societies will never fully be the same. 
By God's grace, we were not hit by Irma very hard. I know there's some people still without power, and they're suffering through the South Florida heat. I know there's a major struggle there. The tragedies that we saw in the assisted living facility down in Hollywood and other, other facilities in the area, those things are, are, are grievous tragedies. These hurricanes have changed culture. The building codes will not be the same come next time. Around. They won't. They always change. We see that people's lives are forever changed because of these hurricanes. Businesses that once thrived will struggle to get their doors open again. Schools and communities will be shifted and altered and changed for, for generation to come. The island of Barbuda, for the first time in 300 years, is completely vacant people. Because it took a direct hit from Hurricane Irma. For most of us, this has been a week of frustration, discomfort, inconvenience, more than a time of great peril. But it's times like this that cause us to reevaluate what's going to last, what's going to be there, what really matters. You see, no human institution can, can claim the prowess of the church. No human institution can claim the authority and the standing of the church. And here's the one reason why. Jesus did not die to found the PTA. Jesus did not die to start the, the Ruiton Club or, or the Kiwanis Club or the YMCA. Jesus did not die to found the United States of America or the United Nations. Jesus died to found the church. Jesus died to found the church. The church bridges the gap between the physical and the spiritual in our lives. The church stands in that gap between this age and the age to come. It connects and holds the here and now with the eternal. You can never underestimate the importance of the church. There's no way to shoot too high on your estimation of how important the church really is. So the question is, how do you view the church? Well, the universal church, yeah, of course. That's, that's got to be a cosmic important. The universal church, God's people are everywhere. Agree. Do you realize the vast majority of the times that the New Testament talks about church is talking about a local body of believers? It's talking about a group that's in a house or in a community that, that of believers in a town that's what the vast majority of the times in the New Testament that we hear the word church, that we see the gathering identified, is talking about a local group. The universal is made up of a bunch of locals. And so the cosmic significance of the church comes down to you and me sitting in this room together, gathered together for the glory of God. You cannot underestimate the importance of the church. You need to grab a hold of how astoundingly great the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is. How astoundingly great gospel life is. Not because of who we are, but because of who He is in making us a body. You know, it's easier to get excited about different things in our society. Football season started. The Hokies are 3-0. I know most of you are really concerned about that. They romped their opponent yesterday, 64 to 17. Sorry, I, I got I digress. When we when we were teaching our boys the days of the week when they're younger and Isaac's still learning, we taught them by the things that we do on certain days. You know, on this day we do this, on this day we do this. And on Sunday, it's you know, Sunday we go to church. We don't say it that way. Sunday we get to go to church. There's an excitement. There's a zeal because I want my boys to know that church is exciting. Church is something that we love and that we long for. Church is the high point of the week. I want them to know that it's more important than any game or hobby 
or club or adventure they could find anywhere else. I say, well, Mark, that sounds really cool, but sometimes it's just not that exciting. So sometimes, you know, it just, it just, it just doesn't strike me as that cool. And stick with me. Bear with me for just a few more minutes and let me show you how awesome and amazing the church is. Like I said, it's of cosmic importance. Not just local importance. It is important locally, but it is of cosmic importance what we do when we gather together. In this passage, the word church, ecclesia in the original language, comes out of nowhere. He's not used it so far in Ephesians. And he comes and he's unpacking this mystery. The mystery that Jews and Gentiles could somehow come together for some strange reasons. Two to that would never be brought together before. Now all of a sudden are being brought together. And he's saying, this is the mystery that's now been revealed. That two who were so separate, there's animosity between them, they didn't like each other, are now coming together and being called brothers and sisters. Together in one place. And he says, this is the church. That's where the church comes from. It's the gathering of those who were once so far apart, now being brought together in Jesus Christ. It comes out of nowhere, but it's referencing what he's already been talking about, about both Jews and Gentiles being partakers in the promise of Jesus Christ. The church is of eternal and cosmic significance. And here's the really cool part. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you're part of it. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you're part of it. Look at verses 11 and 12. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. The good news of the gospel is that by faith, by trust, by believing, by trusting that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and died the death that you deserve. And offers you the freedom of life that He has earned. By believing that you are made part of the church. The, the Bible nowhere has any category for a Christian who's not a part of the church. There's no category for that in the Bible. We, we often think, it's just me and Jesus, it's just me and Jesus. That, that's, it sounds really good, it sounds really American, but it's not biblical. Because the Bible speaks of Christians and there's no category for a Christian who is saved, who is not plugged in to the life of the church. And what we see here is that those who by faith have trusted in Jesus Christ are saved and have access to God and they are the body of the church. That's who the church is. That's who we are. So we cannot simply make the church a good old boys club. Where everybody just comes together and says, Hey, hi. Well, I can't say how about those hokies down here because most of you would laugh. But, you know, how about the Dolphins? See, there are fans from the Dolphins. Cultural relevance right here. Uh, but what we, what we recognize is that we cannot be here just to hang out about trivial matters. We're called to be here about matters of eternity. About matters which go far beyond just mere social engagement. You were made for more than just things of social engagement. You were made for eternity. This hurricane showed us, if nothing else, that everything else is passing away. Everything else is going away. The church is not going anywhere. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ will endure because God has founded it. The cosmic importance of the church in this passage is these, these two things. Making known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Look at verse 10 once again. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Who are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? Significant question. There's 
some debate on who this is actually referring to, but I think Paul answers it best when we ask him in the book of Ephesians who he's talking about. If we look at chapter 1, verse 21, Speaking here, it says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is, that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He's talking about the authority of Jesus, how it's above all rule and authority and power. We get to chapter 2, verse 2, and he clarifies it a little bit more. He says, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And if that doesn't help it anymore, look at chapter 6, verse 12, where he says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, and against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly Places. You know, we know that the church is to be a witness to the world. That's, that's clear. That's the Great Commission. Jesus gave that right before He ascended. But now we see that there's something deeper going on as we gather as a church. There's something greater going on as we gather as the people of God. Because Paul is saying that the church gathered together is declaring something to these rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this is a reference from Paul himself to Satan and the demonic forces that are at war against our king. <coughs> the church has something to reveal, something to make known to Satan and the legion of demons that are allied with him. It's a reference to the spiritual forces of evil. You know, to believe in demons and the devil today is not super popular. It's coming back, believe it or not. If you, if you look at social trends, it, that, that belief is coming back. Spiritism and all of this is bringing back the belief in demonic forces and all of that. that is, that's something we're going to face in coming, in coming years, coming decades. But generally, across most people, the belief in the devil, the belief in demons, well, somebody in red tights me. But it's not a serious consideration. But I believe the reason it's only, it's so downplayed in our society is only a testimony to how tight the grip of the demonic forces actually is. C.S. Lewis wrote a fascinating book called The Screwtape Letters. And it's a collection of letters from his own imagination, but pointing out uh, how demonic forces could possibly work. And it's a let letters from a, a, a greater demon to a lesser demon. Uncle Screwtape is the one writing the letter. He's writing to his dear Wormwood, who is the lesser demon. And so you, you hear it kind of in, in reverse from what we're nor we, we normally would hear. He said this in letter 7. I wonder you should ask me, he's writing to Wormwood, whether it is essential to keep the patient, referring to the person he's supposed to be tempting, in ignorance of your own existence. That question, at least for present, has been answered for us by the high command. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. Of course, this has not always been so. We are really faced with a cruel dilemma. When the humans disbelieve in our existence, we, we lose all the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics. At least not yet. I have hopes that, that we shall learn in due time how to emotionalize and myth mythologize their science to such an extent that what is in effect belief in us, though not under that name, will creep in while the human mind remains closed to belief in the enemy. The enemy referring to God. If once we can produce our perfect work, the materialist magician, the man not using but veritably worshipping what he vaguely calls forces while denying the existence of spirits, then the end of the war will be in sight. But in the meantime, we must obey orders. I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. 
If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights. And persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it's an old textbook method of confusing them, therefore he cannot believe in you. C.S. Lewis, 50 years ago, nails it. Our minds are so bent on the rationalist enterprise that we have cut out practically in how we live the belief in the supernatural. Most Western Christians, by the way that we live, have denied the supernatural and we live as though spiritual realities don't even exist. But if we discount the, the power of demons and the demonic forces, we fail to believe the Bible and we have already failed in our defenses against them. We must realize that Satan and the spiritual forces allied with him are real and they are actively against you as a Christian. Martin Luther of the Reformation said this, He who would have for his master and king, Christ Jesus, who took upon himself our flesh and blood, will have the devil for his enemy. This is reality. This is not Star Wars. This is not Lord of the Rings. This is not Harry Potter. This is reality. In the church, there is a cosmic communication going on. When we gather together as a local body, we are communicating. We are making known. We are displaying something that the spiritual forces allied with Satan have to take notice of. They have to recognize it. They have to see it. The church simply by being together, simply by living as the body, is engaging in spiritual warfare. We must be intentional about it. Do you realize that when you walk in this room, you're engaging in spiritual warfare? We cannot simply waltz in as though this is a simple place, a simple thing. Because there's a cosmic reality going on. What is it that we're communicating? That's the big question. What is it that we are making known? Look at verse 10 once again in Ephesians chapter 3. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. This is what we're making known. The manifold. Many and various. Multi-layered. Variegated. The manifold Wisdom of God here is in direct context referring to the mystery of Christ that's now been revealed. That both Jews and Gentiles can come together in one church under one Lord and be one people together. The wisdom of God through the gospel is what we are making known. The manifold wisdom of God is referencing the great tapestry in which God is bringing many different threads from all kinds of different directions, a vast array of colors and types and styles and weaving them together in what he's called his church for his glory, for our joy. He is ultimately displaying his sovereign, eternal plan. So if we're displaying this, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places as the church, what does this mean? Two questions that bring the gravity of this together for us. Number one, why is the church displaying this? Why? Look at verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. This was God's eternal plan. This was not some sort of secondary plan B. This was not some sort of, oh, wow, that happens. Okay, cool. This was God's eternal plan. So, so back it up with me for a second. Do you see what God is doing? The church is Babel reversed. The church is Babel reversed. God came down to Babel and he saw they're building a tower, making a great name for themselves. This is not going to work. And he squashed their tower. But yet in his church, he is calling the people, the nations that he once scattered across the globe, back together with one Lord and one King. 
and one faith, drawing them back together to be one people. God wants His creation to be unified, but not so that they make a great name for themselves. Not for our glory are we called to be unified, but for His. He desires His creation to be unified, bringing Him glory, and the church is brought together for the glory of God. The spiritual forces allied with Satan were cheering at the Tower of Babel. Not only that they were building it for the name for, for themselves, making a great name for themselves, but they cheered in God's judgment over them making a great name for themselves. And now the church brought together for the glory of God from all directions, all the peoples coming together. The church unified and bringing glory to God is declaring the greatness of God and His eternal plan right in the face of His foes. God is holding up His church as a trophy of His glory and His victory, His authority, His grace, His power, saying, yes, they will be unified, and yes, they will worship Me. While we as a church gather, right now, is a declaration of the victory of Jesus Christ. Do you see the cosmic significance of the church? Do you see what God is doing through us? Second question. How, how, how can we make the gravity of this sink down? The question is, how do we best make this known? How can we Called to declare the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. How can we as the church best make this known? How can we make it known most clearly? The manifold wisdom of God is seen in and through the church as the church lives out our unity in Christ. We must pursue unity in Christ. We must embrace one another as Christians, not merely tolerate one another. And there's a big difference. You know, the city of Sunrise is one of the more diverse cities in Broward County. When we first started meeting here, one of the teachers mentioned to me that this elementary school, Wellaby Elementary School, was at that time the eighth most diverse elementary school in the state of Florida. We live in an incredibly diverse community. And it's a foretaste of heaven. It's a foretaste of what it will be around the throne one day. Gathered together with people from every different people group around the globe. And we are called to pursue our unity in Christ. To celebrate who God has made us to be as one people, as His people. Every single week. We have those who walk through these doors. From different backgrounds, different home languages, we come together to worship one Lord and Savior. This is the unity to which we are called. This is the celebration of God's victory that we are called to embrace. The manifold wisdom of God is seen as people from all nations are brought together in Jesus Christ. Which means that we must be a people who not only gather and pursue unity together, but we must seek the salvation of the nations. That is, that, that is a prime purpose of the church. As we gather together under one Lord with one salvation, becoming one people, that the nations would be called to gather in with that. Not for our glory, but for the worship of our King. That King Jesus, who deserves all the worship, would have worshipers from every corner of the globe. And to this end... We give, we go, we pray. Every week we've been praying for the nations. I hope you call on to that trend. We're praying for the nations that God would raise up worshipers from every place around the globe. We give through the cooperative program of, of, our, of our convention that missionaries would be sent to the furthest places on the planet for the sake of the gospel going to the nations. We send a year ago, we sent a young couple, Eric and Lucy, many of you remember them, to 
to be missionaries. Ultimately, they're going to North Africa. That's their plan. They're in, in the process for that. They went for a brief time to Maryland for more, more uh, extensive experience and training. And within hopefully two years, they will be living in North Africa amongst peoples who do not know the name of Jesus for the glory of God. We just got word this week that our uh, the church we helped in Veltus, Cuba would like us to come back in February. Perhaps you could go. Perhaps you could be a part of sending that team. Part of displaying the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities means seeking the salvation of the nations. Being a part of that, each and every one of us. The manifold wisdom of God is seen not in our focus on minor temporal differences, but in our focus on massive and eternal, our massive and eternal unity in Christ. The reality of the depths of our unity in Christ is far greater than you think it is. In fact, you have more in common with a new Christian from an unreached people in Kazakhstan than you do with your own family members if they do not know Jesus. That is a deep reality that needs to set in for us to realize how deep our unity in Jesus is. The things that typically separate us in society, our age, our gender, our ethnicity, our geography, our sports team, our deodorant flavor, the things that tend to separate us in society are things that cannot separate the church. Because we are called to a far greater declaration. Making known the manifold wisdom of God to the spiritual forces allied with Satan as a declaration of the victory of King Jesus against his foes. We must be a people who think and see through the lens of eternity. As we look at the people around us and love them as Jesus loved us. Are you a part of this cosmic declaration today? You're here. But are you trusting in Jesus? Are you part of his victory? By faith, believing what he has done is for you. We need to be a people passionate for the church. Because it's, it's, it's not my church. It's not our church. It's Jesus' church. So we need to be people passionate for the church. We need to realize we're engaged in spiritual warfare. Every one of us, every week, walks in here to a spiritual battle. I don't know if you've noticed, but Sunday mornings tend to be the hardest mornings at home. It's hard to get out the door. Why? Because there's a spiritual battle being waged. This is not just flesh and blood. It's not just getting the, the, the creaky bones to move. This is a spiritual battle, and we must engage or we will lose. We need to celebrate and live out the reversal of battle. We don't celebrate battle. We celebrate what God is doing in His church. The church is being brought together for the glory of God. And you have the privilege to be part of it. Let us engage together in making known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That God's victory would be known far beyond this place. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of what you are doing. Thank you for the cosmic significance of this gathering. Pray that you would be glorified in it. Each and every week, each and every time we gather together, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. Be magnified today as we trust you. In Jesus' name.